Hello, and welcome back to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, my guest is Eamon Hussain, and Eamon is a uh, Director of Customer Success at Microsoft. Eamon, uh, would you mind giving us a quick 60-second introduction to your background? Absolutely. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, my name is Ayman Hussain. I work for Microsoft, the Customer Success Director. I live and deal with the cloud solution pro- uh, portfolio that Microsoft has. And what I do is evangelize and make sure there's customer lifetime value that comes with it. I deal with customers every day and uh, work around their objectives of success. I mean, tell me this. Um, I- I'm really curious to understand how vendors need to align what they do with the customer's strategy because experience has taught me that most or many salespeople are fixated on hitting their quota, uh, getting a transaction through the how vendors need to align what they do with the customer's strategy the, over the line. And I, I'm interested in uh, understanding why it's so important nowadays to align completely with the customer's strategy. That's a great question. So one of the things we've seen in the last 10, 12 years, if you measure in the context of evolution of industry, our customers are getting smarter. They have outcomes that they need to achieve. Either you're a manufacturing customer or a services customer, there are goals that have to be met. These goals have innovation and a birth at a level of leadership that is beyond those middle management or buyers. They are coming from the board. They're coming from the analysts that control their stock of some level. If you're not aligned to that strategy, what is their strategy for growth, innovation, success? You are missing a big piece of the big picture. I call them horizons. If you don't have those horizons planned, one, two, three, or four, depending on where they are, you're not going to have the end goal of their success in mind. You may have success selling a widget or a gadget at that point in time through that quota that you're trying to close and retire, but you're missing the ultimate goal. And what happens is the customer lifetime value suffers. So it's important for partners and sellers to have that core focus of why you want to achieve the success. Now, depending on who you talk to, some of them will have that answer. If you don't have that answer from that person you're talking to, it is always good to aspire, to aim higher. You can read published reports. If you're trading in the US, you have the 10K reports. You can find what the board is talking about. That is where you start. You have to understand where they're going. It's a destination for them. And that will give you the success, whichever matter of selling you do. So for those who are not familiar with the Form 10K, where do you find that? So it's very easy. If you're a publicly traded company in the United States, you can go to their investor portal. Every United States company will, by law, need to have that portal for them. So if you're just using the internet and doing Google research, you can just type in a 10K and the name of the company, and you'll find amazing amount of documents that will pop up including some that are verified by the SEC, which is the governing organization here in the U.S. If you don't have that, another way to do that is if you have any notion of uh, analysts that sell, like City or Fidelity, you can go to their portals and do free searches. And according to their analysts, because they're looking at you as if someone will buy their stock and or invest with them, you will find all the recommendations that is based on analysis that these companies spend immense amount of money doing research for their buyers and institutional traders. So you can find almost all those. And if you can't take the time to do that, if you're a professional seller in the context of uh, technology, there are websites and there are services that will give you, like DNB will give you those information as well. Who's buying, who are relevant, who are the leaders, who moved, who moved out. And that will also give you enough of that information of what the strategy aligns. You've hinted at something really important here, which is the critical importance of doing your research. Um, When you're operating in the enterprise space, you're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of dollars in cost of pursuit. Doing your research is not a negotiable element of your role. So aside from looking at the Form 10K, What other research are you advising sellers to focus on? That's another great question. So what I, I I am fortunate to live in the internet era, right? I spend almost 90% of my time connected to the internet of some sort. Using search engines, what you can do is tag-based searches. You can have a a compendium of things that you want to look for on a regular basis. Instead of you looking for it, you have them push it to you. So you can set up search profiles that says, hey, I want to talk about Boeing plus their challenges with their new airplane that is not 
flight worthy. So you can create these keyword searches and what they'll do you is a digest that will send it to you. Now you're not, I'm not asking any of my sellers or any of my colleagues to read through pages and pages of documentation. What you want is to look at those taglines that we are benefiting of these tutor like uh, you know, 140 or 240 character based uh, snaps and uh, analysis back to you. So that's the way I do my research. I don't go look for it. I say, this is the book of business I need to build, or these are the customers I really need to focus for, including names of people that I need to focus on. And then I'll create my tax search uh, using Bing or Google and any other search engine that you care for have as a facility. And then you get emailed back to you a uh, context, either a daily digest or a weekly digest. The weekly digest can be big. So if you don't have time set at the end of your work week to go read through that, it becomes challenging. But if you have a daily digest, if you're commuting or if you're just uh, having a cup of tea, you can just scroll through your uh, smartphone and get an amazing amount of information. And because we are collecting intelligence, I mean, this is the Google world, right? They're collecting intelligence of what you want to read and what you're clicking on on the hyperlinks. Guess what? Your articles in your uh, newsfeed reader, either it be from Apple or it be from Google or any other device, it will start stacking those kind of things you're really interested in. And it gives you the ability to not spend time researching and spend time more uh, reading and absorbing. So it is paramount to have an idea. You can't do it all. You can't, if you don't research quantum computing, because there is no sale option for it. That would be a personal innovation. That would be a personal interest. Research that because you want to learn about it. But don't ask a company, what are you doing with quantum computing? Because today there's not a viable product that you can go sell. But research about what quantum computing does. Analytics, fast speed, uh, capability, secure. Maybe those are things you start looking about. Why would somebody be interested in quantum computing? Not because it's fast and amazing. They're looking for secure. They're looking for something that's fast. They're looking for something that has intelligence behind it. Those will be the keywords that will give you success. Uh, another really useful tool is one called soundboard.social. And it curates and collects articles that might be of interest to your customers and your prospects. And it's a widget that sits on Chrome on LinkedIn. And you scroll through their profile, and then you click the soundboard button and opt up a number of articles that may be of interest to your prospects. Because I think one of the other aspects that many people forget is that you are dealing with human beings. And if you can be a source of value, then you can enhance the relationship with your customers. And I think it's really important to not just contact people when you're trying to peddle something to them. Absolutely. I totally concur and agree. One of the things I've started doing in my practice is sentiment uh, analysis. And what I mean by that, everybody has an opinion. You, Marcus, have an opinion. I have an opinion. And we are the kind of people who will publish our opinions in our private blogs or some Twitter blog posts and we'll tag it and otherwise. There's sentiment that follows it. If you have any level of empathy to finding out what a company is doing, follow those people, follow their sentiment, and you'll get an idea of where they're going. For example, today we're in a hard-pressed world with a, a, a situation that's kind of not uh, positive in the economic sense, right? People are getting laid off in different places and world. If you follow the sentiment of layoffs, you'll realize a lot of these leaders that are not getting laid off, but they're at the helm of making these decisions are not having a great time having to lay off their friends and colleagues because of the economic challenges. Their sentiment will tell you what their challenges are, and you'll get a great idea of how, if you wanted to target a service or solution, where you would win if you follow that empathy and sentiment. And that is always a great thing to say, follow people, not just companies and not the financial statements. Follow the people. Uh, at the end of the day, the soul of a company is made of those people. You know, it seems soulless when it's a thousand, hundred thousand person company, but there is an entity behind it. And these people are those driving factors. And that's fantastic advice. And uh, to build on that, um, I, I think the superpower of uh, many salespeople Many salespeople think superpower, their superpower is storytelling, but I believe that the real superpower is conversation. And the problem that many people have is that they don't know how to have great conversations outside of their sphere of speciality. And I think if you can engage in conversation with these human beings uh, who are on the buyer side and also on your partner, uh, in your partners, then it opens up a different quality to the relationship they have with you over other vendors. And if I look at the uh, top salespeople that I know, and I've 
got a pretty decent network. These are people who have the ability to uh, move through different topics of conversation and to align themselves with the interests and uh, the sentiment of their customers and all the people around them who influence the decision. So I'd like to explore the whole area of deriving the closest relationship with both procurement and your channel, because I think those are two areas within a vendor, uh, sorry, within a, a customer who have access to that bigger picture. Procurement sees all these points of pain from the organization and they get sent over the wall to them and they say, help us find a source of solution to solve this problem. And they can be a really rich source of insight. Your partners as well, if they're doing their job correctly, uh, will have visibility across the entire organization. And as a vendor of a point solution, you're just one moving part. And you need to understand where you fit in the grand scheme of things. As Ayman was saying earlier on, you need to understand those horizons. And you need to understand where the business is headed. It's not good enough just to try and hit your quota. You need to see how what you're offering fits within the overall framework, their strategy. What you might be able to replace by bringing your proposition in, is there a way that you can help them re remove three or four competing solutions by solving this other problem? And in order to do that, you have to have those conversations with procurement and with the partners. So, I mean, in your experience, what, what kind of dialogue needs to be set up and what cadence do you need to have in order to establish those kind of quality relationships with procurement and with the chat? Hey. That is a great question, right? So one of the things that I found in the world of procurement, if, if you haven't lived a life of a procurement person, you will understand that they are measured internally for different metrics that they have to carry. Their governance may say, hey, you need to have the, uh, the low cost provider of a service or solution, or you have to have something that has an amazing amount of warranty or maintenance contracts that prevents them from having to spend uh, on the OPEX side of it. So one of the things that I do when I talk to procurement folks is to understand their history of procurement. A, a, a procurement is such a unique proposition within a large organization. Or even a small organization, they have a mandate that they're going to follow. So one of the things I do is I actually do compete research. Now, I have been successful because I work in an industry that has a lot of compete options. Like there's challenges in some organizations, there's only one or two options and you just don't have much negotiation room. But I have had the ability to research. So what I do with procurement folks is I, it's like a job interview. If you are not selected due to a, a job posting and an interview, one of the things I want to do is ask, what could I have done before? And what is the person that got the job, got it because of what skill or competency they had? If I did not appear properly, then I have to work on my appearance and uh, polish on that. If I had uh, incorrect quotas or pricing or structure or the bill of materials was not uh, accurate, I need to work on that. So the same thing works with a procurement buyer, uh, somebody that works in that you ask them, how did the competition get the drop on me? And they may have a contract a couple of years old. Maybe you are competing for the new business now. What I ask is like, how did you succeed? How, how did they get the business? Did they know the right people? Did they have the right pricing? That's a level of research and connection I do. When I, I disconnect my capability with the procurement officer, one of the things is you have to diffuse the conversation. What I find is immediately if I show up and I say, I work for XYZ and I'm going to show you the best thing that will solve your problem, they immediately know you're pedaling. If you have to disconnect from the pedaling, you have to say that I am not here to immediately win your business. I need to improve my proposition so that you are the one contacting me, not the other way around, right? And that is a huge proposition. I use an example for my personal life. I, I was in professional services for many years. And in professional services, you're selling people. That's your commodity. And one of the uh, business leaders I was talking to who was a decision maker uh, loved what I was proposing and loved everything that I was bringing to the table. Unfortunately, the banner I was under, the logo of this company that I was with, was a very small, unknown entity. And after much hardship, this the buyer, the gentleman that was going to make the decision, looked up at me and said, he says, Ayman, I'd love to buy from you, but today I can't. And here's why. If I buy from you and you mess up, 
I will get fired. He's essentially saying that there's a risk that's associated with working with me. However, he name dropped another big professional services firm, one which is gigantic in the world. Of, uh, and, and, and he said, if I buy from them and if they mess up, I won't get fired because that organization had enough hooks into the organization that you. And if you follow professional service and look it up, you'll notice some of these great implementations of SAP or ERP or government contracts always fail. And then you, they get sued and there's libel behind it, but they still get the next contract again. And then you wonder, hey, didn't you get fired and you still got the contract like two years later? How does that work? Because those are brands that carry a level of goodwill. And so when I proposition myself with a procurement officer, buyer, or somebody that's just just going to make a decision. I need to understand what their risk is with working with me. Are they looking at my supply chain? Are they looking at the ability for me to deliver on the commitments I'll make? Because that is not about pricing. That's not about the value. It's not a discount play at that point. I need to know what their success is, not the success of the company, success of how they will succeed in getting the CFO to sign off on a big bill of materials. That's amazingly useful advice. And it makes me think about another question which is if you are a small vendor, does it not make sense in that case, instead of going direct, to go through a computer center, a Capgemini, an Accenture, and then use their credibility in order to be able to win those large enterprise clients? Absolutely. You hit it right on the nose there. So yes, think of the big organizations, they cannot scale. They're, they're in a, to use a pun, they're like a Titanic. They won't be able to turn the boat fast enough. They have rules to follow, hiring, uh, sourcing. They have uh, equality, diversity rules they have to follow. So they can't scale up their teams if it's the professional services organization or an implementation type deal. They have to follow a lot of different things. But what they are very good at is knowing their value props. So if I am, uh, and you, I use defense organizations. I know, Marcus, you've had some experience in the space. Defense organizations, I don't build a rocket ship or a missile system or a weapons technology by one company. That company ends up owning the paper. They own the contract. But underneath that is a plethora of small providers, including one-person shops that will go provide the services and value. Why do they do that is because that contract is held by the government or by a large buyer for the purpose of optimizing the supply chain of whatever it is, the optimizing the one place to go to have the conversation. But underneath that, your value prop may be uh, very unique that that organization themselves may not have it. And so if you are a small provider, you want to work with the large providers, not because you're, you're not able to scale or re- compete, you have an, a need to deflect the things that is overhead. If you're a 10-person shop and you're spending eight of those 10 people's time just trying to prospect and open doors, you're losing valuable commodity and a human resource time. Imagine if that partnership with CAPS or the Accentures or whatever these big large providers are, they took care of that. Now, yes, you may have a reduced ability to negotiate or have amazing ways to uh, you maximize your margins, but you don't have to spend time prospecting. You don't have to spend time owning the relationship, somebody's going to take care of it. But what that gives you is the ability to build your goodwill, the ability to build your value prop. I'm very good at doing X, Y, Z. I've done it with 10 different providers or ISVs in the world, MSPs, and therefore I'm very proficient and prominent in that. Think of cybersecurity. There is an amazing number of cybersecurity firms in the world, small, big, large, all of them. And they all work with other organizations because they're very good at penetration testing or they're very good at hacking or black hat type stuff. But they don't go there and compete against a big cybersecurity organization, which means they don't have to because they will get that opportunity to show the value prop. And so by, by virtue of that goodwill, it takes a little bit of time. But in a couple of years, especially in the internet age, you can become very known and well-known in that commodity space. And to build on that, what we need to understand, first of all, is the channel is not a get-out-of-sales free card. However, one partner can be worth 50 or 100 end-user customers. Um, And I think an area that many vendors really need to smarten up on is treating their partners as genuine partners. We help each other get better. Uh, We treat them as if they are our own. We train them how to sell our stuff. It's not just about giving them the product. We also need to understand how what we offer fits into their portfolio and adds value to what they're offering to their customers so that they find uh, find the motivation to take you in 
If you're just another also ran vendor and you're uh, offering yet another firewall and you're not bringing something that allows them to advance their own interests, then you're not going to get the time of day. You know, if you're talking to uh, a, a distributor, a distributor can have, what, 20,000 or 100,000 SKUs, and you're just one tiny part of that. So you need to invest the time and the effort in understanding what they are trying to achieve, what the individual salespeople are trying to achieve, and help them achieve their objectives. But I, I don't see a lot of that happening. I think the, the very good channel managers do that, and the, uh, the very good vendors do that. But the majority treat their partners like a, a free sales resource or a free technical implementation resource, and they don't really treat them as equals. So what's your advice to people uh, who are in vendors and are looking to build a channel? I'm glad you bring that segue, right? I live in the I, I work for an employer today who built the entire book of business for the last 45 years with channel partners or partners of some level. And if you think of what that they are trying to do, what we are trying to do is proximity to knowing our buyer. At the end of the day, you have to know your buyer. Whatever you're selling, if you're selling canopies in the supermarket, you have to know the buyer at that supermarket in your locality if that canopies makes sense. That is done through a channel that you cannot scale down to that level of distributorship to have that knowledge and analytics, even if you're in the world of internet and collecting amazing amount of data. And the reason I feel some organizations do it well and some don't do it well is understanding the motivation. You hit it very eloquently. If you're looking as an augmentation of your sales team through channel, you're missing the opportunity, right? That you, you cannot offset the need to have a selling team by saying, I'm going to outsource that. We do outsourcing on almost everything and every day of our life. You cannot outsource selling. That is not going to work. If you wanted to outsource selling, then you're not going to have you're going to do a very business-to-business centric organization. You are a distributor. You're not going to have any outward facing field sales. You don't even need that. A great example of this in my mind is Intel. Intel makes processors. They don't have a selling team. They have people that will go talk about their product and highlight it through expositions or different ways of doing it. They, they sell exclusively through the computer makers because they realize that they cannot have a better conversation saying buy Intel versus AMD or whichever the chef processor they're competing against because it makes no sense. They have outsourced the selling to the distribution lines or the, the OEMs or original equipment makers. So if you think of another way of looking at that is the channel has to be created. If you're, if you're an organization that needs a channel, what you that the word channel itself describes what you're trying to do. You're trying to find a mechanism to achieve success for your outcomes of increasing revenue through sales by not investing in a competing organization that will undermine that. So when I am a smaller player, if I'm on the other side of the fence and I want to work with a larger organization, keep in mind there's a compete. If there's a compete factor, if they're going to compete against you, you will probably not succeed. You can't win that conversation. So I would be hesitant to partner up with an organization that's going to try to take away my chunk of change. I use Amazon, the e-commerce retailer example. If you look at 90% of the things that are sold on Amazon is not warehouse in Amazon. And you can tell that if you go put it in your shopping cart, it'll say distributed by or sold by, and it'll be a different name. It won't say Amazon. When it says Amazon, you know they're hosting it, they're carrying the cost of the ERP that they need to do it. But when it doesn't say Amazon directly, then you, you know they are being sold by somebody else. Imagine what they did. They off, uh, The company that's selling the widget has outsourced their distribution ship to Amazon, and Amazon decided not to hold the product. But then look at Amazon again in that same example. They are competing. They are taking the manufacturing uh, products away from people that 10 years ago were making great money by selling through Amazon. They're building their own. I mean, I come from an oil and gas background. You can go buy Amazon branded oil for your car on their website today. Are they drilling holes and pulling oil from the ground? They're not. They actually went and got it from a distributor, slapped a label that says Amazon, and they're selling it. But we imagine all those other sellers, the BPs and the shells that were selling through their portal amazing products to the consumer directly now has to worry about the fact that Amazon's going to take their lunch. That's a bad channel relationship. So we always invest in channel partners and partners in the vice versa. That will never compete with something that we have to offer. Now, that's very challenging when the, the channel partner is significantly large and behemoth in size. And Microsoft is a great example, also a bad example. But if you're in a small place where you don't have to compete with the 
selling force of an organization, you will be successful by giving them the opportunity. Their success, their leadership, their numbers, their quotas will become your goal and you will win very nicely. And that's the way I've uh, talked to my sellers, talked to my peers and a lot of my partners that say, hey, I'm and how can I sell more Microsoft? Well, here are the things we don't do very well. And by the way, I don't have any people doing that. If you did that, you'll be my best friend as a channel partner. Okay, that's really enlightening. And I, I, I want to build on this as well, because I think too many people think of either the channel or partners, but actually it's channels, alliances, and partnerships that we should be thinking about. And over 70% of all products sold on the planet today are sold through partners, alliances, or the channel. And very often, direct sales is seen as the golden child, and the channel is seen as the sort of ginger-haired, bastard, ugly stepdaughter of direct sales. And I think that's driven largely by where the sales leadership and their leadership of the business has come from. And the wrong kind of thinking, uh, which is, well, why should we give away our margin to a third party? Why should we train them when they might sell someone else's or a competitor's product? But I think given the level of complexity of the IT stack at the moment, I mean, just within security, you might have 20 different vendors Within the MarTech or sales enablement, you might have 15, 20 different vendors. And so you are just one small part. Have you given any thought to the whole process of cooperation where vendors collaborate with their competition in areas where you don't necessarily overlap, but where you are complementary? Absolutely. Uh, I live that every day. Uh, I, I, again, so not to uh, plug my own organization here, I'm going to use an example that we recently did. Yes. So Microsoft released a device called the Surface Duo. It's a dual screen uh, phone uh, tablet-like device that you use. The operating system that's running on it is Android. And if you think of Android, who, who is licensed behind that is Google Alphabet, the company itself. Now, we are in dire straits of competition as Microsoft against Google for many different things, from the productivity suite, like Gmail versus Outlook email. We are fighting over the cloud public space, which is the, the Azure versus the Google uh, compute. Uh, and so we think about it, we're competing. We're competing with Google, but here we decided to have an alliance on Android, a device mobile uh, operating system for our smartphone. And the reason we did that is because they do it well. They're not gonna compete with us in that space because we don't even have an offering. We can proposition them to use something that's productivity you've done very well in the world of markets. So, so when I think of competition, I'm not trying to say that we do it better, therefore position my product. I'm saying it's complementary. It, it's similar to talking about tires in your car. Original manufacturer of a brand new car will have a tire that may say Bridgestone on it, but then you can go put uh, Michelin's on it. What did those people all at some level in their history do? They came up with standards. They came up with some mechanism saying a tire will have a size that will work for everybody. Manufacturing quality and the demographics will decide if or how it's going to compete and where it's going to compete for. So when I think of competition, it is the paramount way of entering without having to cover the massive gap. If you are professional services and, and you're a product organizations, if you're selling desktops on laptops and you need someone to integrate it, you can find an integrator that also sells desktops on laptops. But what you're trying to do there is integrate the capability that you are better at managed services. Therefore, I think we need to go together in this initiative and venture, but I am better at distributorship. Maybe I am the direct seller. Maybe I am getting a large capability to save margin by saving and giving it to my buyers or my consumers because I have a better deal on that option. Think of the overseas markets. A lot of these large computer manufacturers will have to sell through distributorships, cannot sell directly because of country laws, geography laws, or just the fact that the supply chain is not predictable. They cannot just order a thousand devices and have them show up tomorrow like we would do in the US or in the UK. So you have to have the competition. But at the same time, those organizations that are doing the distributorship at the end, last mile may have competing services. They may have the ability to do certain things differently than you would. So instead of competing that, you set the ground rule up. You, you find those complementary areas. It, it is 
if you want to go down to the consumer mindset, it's like pairing good food with a bottle of wine that may not be the bottle of wine that you would choose, but you still do it because it complements the flavors or complements the dish you're having. You have to have complementary capability. If you're competing at that level, you have to really make a decision like, is my solution better than my competition's? Honesty is important there. One of the things I live is like, we don't do everything very well. There's If, if you drank the Kool-Aid, and got drunk on it. That's a problem. And for viewers outside the U.S., Kool-Aid is this popular kid's drink that every drink. We use that as a vernacular to say that if you're drinking something that it gives you a cult-like status and you're brainwashed and you believe it, there is a level of challenge there. You have to understand there are deficiencies in everybody's portfolio of products and services. You have to understand your strengths and weaknesses. If you're falling on the weakness side, do not compete there. Find somebody that will cover the gap on the weakness. But if you're on the strength side, absolutely compete there. I couldn't agree more. I mean, and one of the things that when we wrote the book, Making Channel Sales Work, was look for ways that uh, your strengths complement one another. Find people whose strengths make your weaknesses irrelevant. And I think it's so important that when we are looking at the level of complexity, the strategic importance of these purchases that uh, the end customer is making, that we don't lose sight of the fact that we are in business because of the customer, not in spite of them. And so in terms of how we compensate our salespeople, our partners, I know you've got some really interesting thoughts on this. And um, certainly uh, having spoken to Patty Hatter over at uh, Palo Alto, they grew their professional services sales by, I think it was 93% in one quarter by moving from their traditional pricing model to outcome-based pricing. I'm curious to find, your, uh, find out your thoughts in terms of how you compensate the people who sell, the people who increase and improve utilization, the people who drive stickiness, and uh, the people who drive renewal. Because I think at the end of the day, what we really want are lifetime customers. The people who are short-sighted are focusing on the transaction. The ones who have a strategic perspective are thinking about how do we keep these as customers for life and then turn those accounts into marketplaces. So your thoughts on that? That, that I, I'm glad you segue into that. Uh, so I'll use a couple of examples here. Outcome-based selling is very new in the world of selling. If you think about how compensation works, uh, we, we, outcome selling makes it challenging for uh, the product that you sold. In Palo Alto's case, it's very relevant because Palo Alto and all sense of the purposes is creating essentially the front gate for all things internet enabled or sometimes not even internet enabled. They are the cusp of security or that firewall or that segregation of uh, private traffic to public traffic. If you take that outside the focus of it, what is the outcome somebody needs in that world today, right? If, if you look at, uh, I, I'll use a very non-technology example. Uh, th there's a gentleman, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Mohamed Dunis, who uh, was uh, the pioneer behind Michael Len Lending. He has a, a for-profit organization in his country of origin, which is Bangladesh. And what he did is he uh, partnered with Danon, the yogurt maker, and he said, hey, let's make yogurt and give it to the population who is uh, not getting enough uh, food and nutrition. But instead of using KPIs of how many cans of yogurts or a little, little packets of yogurt we're selling, Let's make the KPI based on the amount of nutrition we're giving to the uh, malnutrition kids. So they put a KPI saying, I'm not going to count the number of boxes of yogurt that left the store or the, or the factory. I'm going to look at the health records to see how many kids are not malnutrition in a school district or otherwise. So if you think what he did there, he's saying, I'm going to measure you on your success of preventing something which is he was passionate about is re reducing malnutrition. So think of it in the technology sense. If I were in the technology world, I live in the public cloud world. Public cloud, while it's reliable, resilient, and great, does have its problems, does have its challenges. So if I want to sell an outcome to you, a buyer, say you want to put your entire e-commerce platform into the public cloud, I need to ask you, what is the outcome that would be best relevant for you? For example, uh, in the US, we, have, we used to have, before COVID, the Black Friday event, which is a holiday, the Thanksgiving holiday. Everybody goes buy stuff. I think China has something equivalent where they have the singles day where they're buying amazing amount of stuff. If you're an e-commerce provider, you cannot anytime anticipate an outage. You cannot have it. If you have an outage for more than a few seconds, you're losing millions of dollars. 
So okay. I want to focus on that. I'm going to go to you say, look, my technology, my solution, my services will give you an outcome of 10 nines of uptime or five nines or four nines, whatever the SLA you want, you bind to it. And then you create a structure that says, if I meet that outcome, there will be something in return, a premium or some kind of a service or some kind of accelerated that I get either from my sales manager or from the vendor product producer itself, because that person who's going to invest in the Palo Alto or any device of that nature that gives you resilience and reliability in the e-commerce world or the world of internet is looking at the fact that you will not cost them something that is irrelevant to the technology at that point. They are selling things on singles day or on Black Friday. They don't care what device it was. They don't even say it's Palo Alto devices, but if that Palo Alto device fails and you had an outcome tied to it, you can make decisions based on that in the future. Either you get discounts, you have some level of structure. Now, as a sales leader, someone like yourself, Marcus, you will have to actually create programs for your sellers and you have to convince your board and your organization to say, these are ways we can further compensate. It's going to give you two things. One, it'll give you the ability to create loyalty for the seller to stick around. If there's a pave that is going to come in three years time, like, hey, if, if somebody bought $10 million of cloud compute over a period of three years, and at the end of three years, if that customer used all of that $10 million commitment, but also renewed for another additional 10 million because they fell in love with what you did and the service was awesome, I'll give you an accelerator, but you have to stick around for it. You can't just sell it first year and dump and run because then you lose out on it because then you're going to be focused on this year one sale. Let me just get the paper in the door, sign off, and I get my commission and bonus. It's the same way we do stock grants in the US. You, you don't give a stock grant that is immediately effective. You give it over a period of investment of five years or six years, whatever you do it, because you want them to stick around for that value of it. We need to translate down that to the channel. We need to translate that down to the seller. In the channel world, I want channel partners to say, if you help me put these in the marketplace and grow this line of business over a period of time, I'm going to reward you, not like a bonus, but reward you with better discounts, better pricing, better premier, premier status that will give you the ability to win on those conversations previously not available. Well, this then leads on to the next really important point, which is happy partners mean happy customers. And again, one of the things that frustrates me is the lack of attention in the channel, not only in terms of how you compensate them, but also in terms of other reward. For example, training. Training them consistently, not just in product, but how to sell. Helping them achieve their business objectives. Helping them to grow giving them access to resources, research, getting them access to end customers. I think it's Ambassadors is a company that is essentially made up of X fortune 500 executives. And this kind of thing can be incredibly valuable. But very few vendors are thinking creatively in terms of how they can make the ecosystem in which their partners operate even more attractive and more useful to them. So uh, I know that you spend a lot of your time speaking to the sales teams and helping them gain insight into the customer's mind. Talk to me about a couple of the bloodbaths, first of all, and some of the uh, lessons that you've been able to impart to the uh, sellers uh, simply by getting exposure to the minds of the end user buyer. That's a great question, right? That, and I, I like the way you approach it. So uh, in, in the world of sales, and you're a veteran in there, so you know that methodologies have changed. One of the methodologies that I've adopted for coaching purposes with my sellers and people that are driving some level of customer interaction is the challenger mindset. Now, there's an entire portfolio of challenger mindset selling. I don't care for the, the discipline of it. What I want to focus on the word challenge. You have to ask somebody why they want to do something. A sale is very easy to do. If there's need and budget, the, the band stuff that we always talk about, you can make the sale right there. But you have to ask somebody, why do they want it? And if you don't get the why, you will have an outcome that will not be favorable. And, and that's one of the things that I coach my things. So the bloodbaths I've had to deal with, or firefights, or dumpster fires, as we say it in the US, has been the fact that we did not ask the why. Why did you want to do this? I only use this example that is a real life example for me. Again, coming from the professional services background, I had a customer that says, hey, I hear this cloud thing. This is a few years ago. That's awesome. I want to go to the cloud. Take me to the cloud. 
I was professional services. I had architects and engineers. We made this amazing architecture roadmap guidance. It was flawless. And we took the man and, and his organization into the journey of the cloud, and we were successful. What happened at the end of the journey is the customer came back to us and said, hey, this is great, but my costs went up by 25%. I was like, yeah, cloud costs money. First year is usually a ramp up. And he had a look of dismay. And I was like, why? I'm like, everything's working. Your uptime's better. Your resilience is better. You, you don't have to worry about floods and mitigation of hurricanes. Why, why are you so concerned? And he looked back and said, you know what? I needed to reduce my costs. And I'll tell you why. Because he was looking for an exit strategy. He was going to sell his company. And he needed his cost for operations to come down, not go up, because he wanted to look valuable. Had I asked that, Day one, I could have optimized their on-premise data center and services and apps to be less than 20% the way he wanted. And in win that conversation because his why was, I need to make my valuation look better because I have buyers that's going to look at my company. I want to merge and get out. And I need it to look better, not have a cost go up. So sometimes the need and the want has to be backed up with a why. And that's one of the bloodbaths I deal with all the time. So why do they want that? What, what, what is so important for it? If it's a me to play, and I, what I mean by me too is like, just because you sat next to somebody on a flight that was a CEO of a bigger company said, I'm doing this and this is awesome. You don't come home and tell your, uh, your subordinates and uh, people under you to go do that. You have to have a why. Not all good decisions in technology are based on the need of why. There are great, I'm like, use COBOL. I'm like, you're familiar with COBOL, programming language. The reason it perseveres today it's because there's not a need for people to move off it. There's not a why to modernize that platform that still exists in the grunt works of our technology platforms and banking. I'm like, there's a need. You have to have a need to move off. Like Y2K is a great example. Everybody jumped on that bag and let's go, go from two digits to five or four digits. There was a why there. And that's why there was a lot of innovation. But imagine having a conversation in 1980 with the technology leaders saying, hey, you need to change your programming code to have four digit years versus two digits. They would have no idea why you want that and they may not even care. But come December of uh, 1999 and people are freaking out or 20, 2000, whichever way that the digit was going to turn because they have a why. So always look for the why. Otherwise, you're going to have a challenge for the customer lifetime value. That is what I really want. I work for a brand that's going to be around for another 50 years or more or 100 years. I need that customer to stay there. It's like the airline industry. You could fly in an airplane that has the worst service, but if that flight attendant that served you drinks or took care of your brought you pillow, had a smile and a welcoming attitude, you may actually go book the flight again on that flight and that plane because you remember that flight attendant that made you feel okay, took care of your need at that point. So regardless of the brand, you will always go back to it. The customer lifetime value is very important. It's really interesting. Uh, I don't know if you follow a chap called Colin Shaw. Um, I've heard of it. I haven't had a chance to follow it. Uh, Colin, good recommendation. Colin is a, a genuine expert in um, understanding the customer. And uh, he makes the point, and the neuroscience backs this up, that most, many of our purchases are built around our memories. And I think part of the problem that I see in sales as a profession, and I use that term exceptionally lightly, and this is someone who loves selling and salespeople, is that we are anything but a profession. I think we're a bunch of people who wing it and who don't put the time in, who lack the intellectual curiosity to keep asking the question why. And where have they come from? What are the experiences that they have had? And there are two really useful points of reference. There was a book by Chris Anderson called The Long Tail, which really sparked my uh, curiosity. He made the point that Amazon makes more profit of selling one book once than it does by selling the Harry Potter series, because most of those are lost leaders or they're sold at very, very low margin. And if you add up all the books that they've sold, um, they've made potloads more money uh, from those one-offs. Another fabulous book is called Be More Pirate. Um, and unfortunately, I can't remember the name of the author. But Be More Pirate talks about how the pirates, there were basically 200 uh, ships populated by maybe 50 to 150 uh, sailors. And these pirates all clubbed together. And in one week, they sacked Panama and took the equivalent of about $68 billion in gold, and then they dissipated. And I think my friend Zach Selch, who 
is just about to release his very uh, anticipated book on the channel, says it's the, not the strong that devour the weak, it's the agile that devour the slow. And in this market, in this economy, the way things are changing, and read the Gartner report on uh, the future of sales, we have to be incredibly agile. We have to think. Selling is a thinking profession. It's not something you just turn up, show your product, and then beetle off with an order. Those days are long gone. You have to think, where do we fit? What is our customer trying to achieve? Why are they doing this? Why haven't they done it before? Why now? And you made the point about challenging people. And like you, I think the concept of the challenger sale is great. Uh, unfortunately, in order to do that well, you actually have to understand the mechanics of a business. You need to understand where they've come from, where they are, where they're headed. You need to understand all the different moving parts, how they all interrelate and they're interdependent. Because just turning up and challenging someone just makes you sound rude. And I, I think we have to get away from the idea that there is an adversarial relationship with our customers. It's not them versus us, it's we. And the analogy I like to use is that we need to build enough trust and have the influence to have them step out of the goal mouth. And it's us, together with their, uh, our partners and the customer, kicking into an open goal against their problem. And I, I want to wrap up on that because that whole piece around creating a real kinship between the customer, the partner, and you as a vendor requires you to think about the customer, have them front and center in everything you do. And this also relates to how the internal mechanics of your own organization work, because um, very often one of the biggest problems that vendors face is dealing with the internal obstacles. And I think part of that has to come from leadership pushing uh, the values of the business and being clear about what your mission is and why you exist. Let's finish on that thought in terms of making sure that you have that internal alignment so that you are committed to that partnership mentality uh, when you're uh, going out to the market. Absolutely. So that's a great way to wrap up. One of the things that uh, it, within an organization, either be sales or manufacturing or whatever it is, the division makes a difference. Now I'm talk, not talking about lofty visions, not, not we're going to be a billion dollar company by XYZ time. It, it's the vision of what you want to achieve in that quarter, segment, year, whatever way you measure time in the context of what you do. One of the things that I've been successful with is having that honest conversation with the business of your whatever it is you're doing with your sales focus, like what is the outcome you want to achieve internally? And profit is always easy. Growing sales is always easy if you're in the right place at the right time. But there's an outcome that goes behind it. That connection to that, that goal within the organization will now give the ability to spearhead a conversation with the, the customer. So one of the things that we lack in the, it, it may be just the way the organization of sales have rose, risen up is uh, we make connections at a personal level. That's why sales people, when they leave company A and go to company B, take the relationships with you. It is a very personal entity. You have to have the relationship because they will continue to buy from the same person regardless of what you're selling if you have made the connection. That is the base of a personal goal. If you are a sales person, you have to have a goal. You, you have, this is not easy money. Good tenured sellers don't give, make easy money. You, you earn their key by growing into the business. So you have to have a personal mission statement of what you want to do. And if you get that, if you write it down, whatever way you motivate and self-energize, you have to have that capstone available to you in your mind. Otherwise, you're not going to succeed. If you cannot convince yourself why you're a seller, you're just going to follow the sales reports and playbooks and just throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. You have to believe in the mission. Now, if you're working in an organization where you're not passionate about the mission because it's a product that you're not passionate about, Rethink your life. Rethink about the, the the organization you're working for. But you have to have passion 
because customers can read you. They can see if you're genuine, if you have authenticity. Those are not qualities you have added to your sales leadership or sales acumen. You are going to miss a big chunk of business that you're leaving because then you're just a commodity. They're not remembering you. They're remembering a slide deck you left behind. They need to remember you not the content that you left behind. It's easy to print and put PowerPoints on the wall. They need to say, hey, who was that guy that showed up? Can I call him because he had a great idea? I don't remember what it was, but I just remember he was there. I want to call that person. Instead of, hey, let me look through my email for that PowerPoint. I don't know who it came from. I'm just going to look at some keyword searches. You need to kind of have that authenticity and genuine capability and be honest with yourself. Sales is not for everybody, but the ones who are succeeding are not doing it because they have tricks and not they're whining and dining and golfing. They have found a way to connect to the people and drive demand based on that authenticity of their capability. Well, and reading the Gartner Future of Sales report, there is a really disturbing figure in there, which is that 33% of all buyers desire a seller-free experience. Now, that if that isn't a damning indictment of our profession and a reason why we need to uh, sort ourselves out, I don't know what is. Because the level of complexity that these people are you know, that they're going to be buying, it really does require human-to-human contact. Uh, yes, AI is moving on at a pace, but that's not going to give them the peace of mind. And we need to turn up fully prepared, well-researched, and make sure that every minute that we spend in front of the customer is delivering immense, irrefutable value. Now, KPMG did a study last year that suggested that only six minutes in every hour did CXOs find value in a salesperson being in front of them. Okay, so wake up, pay attention to what we've talked about today, and really take a good, long, hard look in the mirror and think about your process. Are you customer centric? Are you partner centric? Are you fully aligned? Do you have a clear mission? that is about serving the customer? Are you engaging in great conversation with them? Are you getting ahead of their problems? Are you the tip tiller? Um, So the tip tiller is the small rudder that turns the big rudder on a tanker. That's how you turn the tanker, by being the source of insight, by curating good material and content, and by bringing fantastic, insightful questions. It doesn't, uh, the, the uh, tanker doesn't turn because you've turned up with and fired up your laptop and you've got PowerPoint um, with a picture of your headquarters on it. That's the kind of stuff that will get you thrown out. And seven out of eight first meetings nowadays end up in no second meeting. So if you think about the waste that that represents in terms of marketing spend and energy and effort and how much blood, sweat and tears you have to make to prospect to get a meeting. This, I hope this has been uh, a wake-up call. So, uh, Ayman, um, tell me this. What, what are you struggling with? What are you wrestling with at the moment? The struggle I have with my employer and myself is impact. And what I mean by it is meaningful impact. We are a world of consumer products and uh, enterprise products. We have to drive impact. We Impact to personal self, impact to the society, economy, ecology, you name it, sustainability, many different ways of science. So what I struggle with is how do I convert a gadget or a widget that I'm going to provide to a buyer to show a meaningful impact to something they do? It is very hard for me today to translate a meaningful impact when you're buried in, in many layers of product or solutions that does not provide the end result that makes sense. It is a challenge that I'm uh, taking on myself to get better with. So every customer that I approach, I need to understand when I finish wrapping up my sales pitch or elevator pitch or a presentation or about to give him a bill of materials, how is that going to drive meaningful impact that I can now measure for them in a few years' time? It could be once and done sale or it could be once and many sale. I need to come back and talk about that impact because that is, that, that is what I call the cost of not doing something that we often forget. Like I use the airline mechanic an example, right? When an airplane takes off and lands, you applaud the pilot. You never go down and applaud the mechanic that made sure it was functioning. But when that same airplane crashes, the first person that calls up is the mechanic and you blame or 
find out what went wrong. You don't talk about the fact the pilot may have been in error too. That's where you go, mechanical challenges. We need to start rewarding something that did not happen. And customers want that. You reward a customer saying, hey, listen, because you and I had a relationship, we bought something three years ago. These are the things that you did not have to deal with. I want to reward your impact of those things by making a better conversation happen. And so that is the thing I struggle with. How do I translate that meaningful impact that I can measure and bring it back to a customer saying, this is what you eluded or went through and did not have to suffer? Uh, Actually, there is a really elegant solution to that. And that is the customer hero story. The problem that I see is very often when case studies are produced, they make the vendor or the product the hero. And uh, I have a, a client, a good friend of mine now, Alex Mosco, and he specializes in telling the customer hero story. And the trick to this is to go and interview customers. And uh, in fact, I, I personally, I think you should speak to both ends of the spectrum. I think you should speak to your raving fans and customers who are happy and satisfied. And you should also speak to people who loathe and despise you so you can find out why. The ones who fired you, the ones who went with another vendor, and also the people who've suddenly changed their behavior. Either they've started or stopped doing something. But the customer hero story is really interesting. If you go and speak to the uh, the customer and you find out about their journey in their career, so find out about them, their line of work, how long they've been in the industry, what attracted them to it, their current roles and responsibilities, how long they've been doing it, how they're measured, what their objectives are, and then what they'd like to achieve in their time in the role. Find out why it's important to them. Understand what prevents them from being successful, what they've tried to fix it, how well those uh, attempts worked, why they started looking for your service, and go through that whole story so that you can start to understand why they picked you, what results they've had, how they were personally impacted. And also, when they were looking, did they consider anybody else? What was their decision-making process and who was involved in making that decision? What were the other decision-makers' priorities? And if you do that, it's incredible just how much insight you get. I interviewed Dr. Uh, Laura Janasek, And uh, she said, listening is the transfer of meaning. And I think what we really need to understand is what the customer actually mean, what their intent is. It's not just good enough to see what their intent is now, but what their intent is longer term so that we can stay ahead. And I think that's where we can do some really powerful work with our customers. And when we're prospecting, prospect two to five years ahead, Uh, You touched on it earlier on when we were talking about procurement. Turn up, I'm not here to sell to you now. I want to understand the mechanics of how you work, how you measure, what your criteria are, and so on. Same thing, I think, needs to happen. If you're going after an enterprise account, start prospecting for it two, three years in advance. Don't just turn up and say, I want to sell you something now. Think ahead. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think that's great sage advice and uh, acumen that, enhances somebody who's passionate about selling and being a seller in the world of uh, many options. I think uh, the the advice you provided about prospecting and having that mindset uh, brings proficiency. Uh, If you're an industry seller, uh, you're selling defense, you're selling uh, computers, you're selling services, uh, you tend not to just diversify by jumping from industry to industry. You you prospect because you understand, you get to know the domain very well. I think that's very relevant in our industries and uh, the kind of work I do. You have to know the book of business that you're passionate about or want to do and uh, follow the trend, follow the history, follow the future and have enough research. And it doesn't have to be detailed encyclopedia research. You, you can do it in a very small amount of time having that vision. Think of it like one of those college papers that you have to write an assignment. You have to do your research if you want to differentiate your thesis or your paper from the next person writing the same thing. You have to have unique insights that is personalized based because you're a human being and you have opinions. And that's the way I feel you are going to be a better success as, as a seller is not look like the next seller that walked in the door because they need to know more than your fashion and your face. They need to know something that was unique about your experience. Excellent. 
So cheeky question. If you had a golden ticket and you could go back, and this isn't about regret, but if you could go back and advise the idiot I'm an age 23, uh, what choice bit of advice would you whisper in his ear, even though he might ignore you? That, that's great. You know, I've spent some time thinking about it. one of the advice I would have given myself at, at that early age of my life is uh, have a healthy dose of being a rebel because I felt conformity has stifled innovation in my life. I wanted to belong. I wanted to be like somebody and I had to fit into that norm. I think the healthy amount of rebellion that I would have had in those early years would have made difference. And if you Think of the rebels in our society today. You think of Mark Zuckerberg, who created Facebook Empire. He was a rebel. Like if you go back far enough, he was a rebel. Uh, Bill Gates himself was a rebel in his early days when he created Microsoft. You have to have enough rebellion in that early age. And if you look at these two gentlemen I just named, they were rebels in their years, early years, not later years. And they became successful because of that. I would want to go tell myself, hey, have a little bit of rebellion in you. Be conform or not conforming and stifle because it's going to stifle innovation. Because I wanted to get to be like the others and belong. And I think that's the advice I would give anybody in any age, like have enough of a rebel in you to not conform because you will miss some of the innovation that is otherwise uh, masked. Well, there, there are two books um, that uh, your 23-year-old self would have appreciated then. One I've already mentioned, Be More Pirates, and that's by a guy called Sam Conniff, C-O-N-N-I-S-S. And the other one is Rebel Ideas by Matthew Syed, S-Y-E-D. And I think the, the really important part about being rebellious is it forces you to think differently. And conformity, I think one of the problems with humanity as a species is given the opportunity to be different, uh, what we'll tend to do is do what everybody else does. It's like fashion. You join the punk movement in the 80s because you wanted to be different and then you look like everybody else that's the irony and i think that you should challenge yourself and listen to and uh, connect with and read stuff that you find uh, opposes your perspective i think one of the healthiest things that i've learned to do in the last 10 years is subscribe to feeds uh, of people whose opinions i disagree with vehemently because I think if we live in a bubble, especially the way the social media algorithms work, all we get is a massive amount of confirmation bias. And I think by being the grit in the oyster, that's where the pearl comes from. So I absolutely agree with you on that. What, what would be some books or podcasts or videos that you would recommend people pay attention to because they are either inspiring or um, they are insightful in a way that is rare. That, that, that's great. So one of the things I do on a regular basis, I, I will uh, search for almost anything that's tech talk oriented, regardless of topic and uh, structure, for the purpose of what I do for that. If it's a video TED talk, watch how people deliver messages. Somebody could sell you toilet paper for all that you will know, but the way they deliver is important. So when I want to brand myself, when I want to improve myself is how are people delivering? So TED Talks is a great way, not only get content, but also understand how to deliver that message out. Uh, and, and that's what I, I do a lot of. So I actually have a YouTube channel of uh, a subscriber, a subscribed content that is all about TED Talks or technology talks or any talk. It could be astronomy for all I care. It's about how they're delivering the content. The other thing, and I, I, I have several books I've read, but I, I, what I've decided to do because of a constraint of time is I actually look at two journals out there on the internet uh, to just consolidate my daily need to learn about leadership or otherwise. Forbes is one that I subscribe to. I look at everything in Forbes because it's easy, it's, e it's digestible in the small accounts, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a synap it's synopsis. It's not a big read. And the other one is business. Business Insider. That's more for my day job. I do those two things on a regular basis. I read those podcasts that are appearing there. Even if it's not important, like one of the reasons I cross paths with you is like someone recommended that, hey, you should uh, listen to what Marcus has to say. It, it's, it's that innovation that came from by looking at those Forbes and use Business Insider journals and the content that go with it. I had to limit myself to those two areas because that's where I spend most of my free time is trying to gather the knowledge. Otherwise, you are overwhelmed with a lot of knowledge without the ability to act, like this whole context of being a rebel. There's several books that talk about that. But if I read that, I'm not being rebellious in my life now. I can't go make changes because I'm just spending time reading. It's no different than watching TV or 
streaming shows, right? So I need to change that habit. And what I'm doing is digestible chunks, small chunks, curated chunks through things you have to pay for. It's not free. Sometimes you have to pay for it. So Business Insider and Forbes are the two places I spend a lot of time just to make my uh, commercial and uh, uh, work life simpler, easier, and much uh, reasonable. Excellent. Ayman, thank you so much. This has been incredibly insightful. How can people get hold of you? That's great. So uh, I, I live in the social media circles of LinkedIn, but if you wanted to get hold of me, you can look myself up. My name is Ayman Hussein. I work at Microsoft in the US. I live in the city of Houston, uh, and I will provide to you privately my contact inform- information you can publish as well for them to get hold of me. But if you want to find me, find me on LinkedIn. I'm in Hussein, A-Y-M-A-N, H-U-S-A-I-N. I work for Microsoft, put those two keywords together and you'll find me immediately. Excellent. I'm in Hussein, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Marcus. You have a good one. This is Marcus Cappy signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this insightful, then please get in touch, either with myself or I'm in and uh, you can get hold of me on marcus at laughs-last.com, and you can get hold of me on LinkedIn as well. Now, if you think you'd be an interesting guest, then please do get in touch. Or if you know somebody who would be as well, then please connect the two of us on LinkedIn, and I'll do my best to get them on. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.